to introduce Mike Dienstra. This is the talk, What the Hack? Fortifying Your Security by Understanding Your Adversary. Mike Dienstra is a threat analyst at WordFence. He believes that the best way to understand something is to try and teach it to someone who believes they'll never understand it themselves. The internet is a pinnacle of human collaboration, but at the same time, it can seem prohibitively difficult to make proper use of for the layperson. By making tricky concepts as digestible and accessible as possible, we stand to greatly improve the experience not only for the organizations building the web presence, but for the future users as well. So please give me a hand. Yeah. to be a bad guy. It used to be, you know, if you 
got some skill in hacking and you're not immediately working for the government or uh, working in security at a company, you're kind of out of luck. So you might as well sell data or exploit stuff and steal credit cards or what have you. On the consumer level though, we know that awareness is rising because the security conscious layperson is becoming a, a demographic that is just actively marketed to. Um, about uh, a year and two months ago, well, September 2017, uh, does anybody know of a little company called Equifax? <laughs> no, no. Raise your hand if you don't know what I'm referring to. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, in September 2017, uh, the credit reporting bureau Equifax disclosed that there had been a massive security breach. Uh, at the time, they said that there were about 143 million uh, accounts of user data that had been leaked to God knows where. And uh, even later on, it was determined that there was even more than that. Um, and following that, we see this wave of, I mean, if you listen to the radio in your car, there's about a, there's about a billion percent chance that uh, you've heard of a dark web analysis service where there's a company that's promising you that we're going to listen to chatter on the dark net and where all the evil bad guys talk to each other and we're going to tell you if we hear your name or your email address or the name of your company. And uh, having audited some of those, I can pretty confidently say that don't, uh, don't waste your time. Um, but the fact is, is they see a market there. They know that people are more conscious of their security posture than ever before. And just because some of them are a little exploitative of that doesn't mean that they haven't recognized people care now. Um, but despite this improved awareness, these attacks keep succeeding. So. Uh, and, and these aren't really all super sophisticated attacks either that are just you know, unpreventable uh, uh, golden bullets that can kill the sky. Uh, Equifax's data breach, uh, the one that leaked 140 something million uh, user accounts, was a vulnerability in Apache Struts. Uh, the vulnerability itself had been patched two months prior to the breach even beginning, and they failed to patch it until they identified it uh, two months after it started. So there is this four month long gap where they knew that there was a patch to be done and hadn't gotten around to doing it. And, and saying had, hadn't gotten around to it is a little reductive. I mean, we all work in uh, places where maybe an update needs to be vetted first, but something that serious, um, it, there's sort of no arguing that they dropped the ball at least a little bit there. Um, more recently, uh, the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Georgia city government uh, was hit by a ransomware attack. Uh, this was in March of this year. Uh, has anybody not heard of that? That one's a little bit less publicized than the Equifax thing because it's old, you know, if you don't live in Atlanta or you're not in the security space, you maybe not, uh, maybe wouldn't have heard it, but they did. Uh, almost the entire Atlanta city government's network was taken down by the SamSam ransomware. Um, and there hasn't been a public disclosure of the vector of that attack yet, um, but Circumstantial evidence and just the type of uh, attack sort of, uh, seems to suggest that the eternal blue vulnerability was responsible. That one I bet even less people have heard of. But you may have heard of WannaCry, the ransomware that swept Europe and, and took down hospitals and all that. WannaCry was almost exclusively distributed through this vulnerability in the Windows File Share service. And it comes down to um, everybody seems to think they are the exception. And, and they know that there's an update, they know it's a security patch, um, but you know, for some reason I put it off, it'll be okay, right? Um, it's at this point um, that I want to get a little bit of audience participation, um, especially because it's the morning on second day of a word camp, so all of you are zombies just like me. <laughs> um, so raise your hand, and you don't even have to like move or get up or anything, but you do have to shout. Um, so raise your hand if you want to improve the security posture of your business by 30% in five seconds. Yeah. Okay, uh, right there. What's your name? Glenn. Glenn. I want you to say, my name is Glenn and I am not the exception. My name is Glenn and I am not the exception. Anybody else want to do it? Just go, do it. My name is Glenn and I am not the exception. All right. So now that we've gotten past that, we can start fixing this a little bit. So, we're all on WordPress, that's kind of why we're here. WordPress 
powers 30% of the internet right now, and that is insane. And it's 60% if you only count sites that are using some distributed content management system. Um, a 30% market share of anything is sort of legendary. Um, I mean, and, and there's Coke and Pepsi and whatever, but um, it's, it's the simplest sort of supply and demand there is. If there is a market of people using something, it is profitable to exploit that. It, it couldn't get more basic than that. Um, and the example I like to give here for this is, uh, who remembers 2007? I hope so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a wild year. Um, so, uh, between 2007 and 2009, um, well, it was, you know, the first couple of years the iPhone was out, the smartphone was coming into vogue. But this was also the years that we were seeing the Get a Mac campaign on TV. Everybody remember, uh, hi, I'm a Mac, hi, I'm a PC. Uh, hi, I'm cool and trendy, and hi, I, uh, I, I play chess by myself or something. But um, the entire, uh, this was back when um, uh, Mac OS X had about a 4% market share in, in the desktop space. And, and this was this, you know, oh, I'm only for office software, but oh, I'm cool and I have friends and do Photoshop stuff. And more than any of that, you would see, I'm a PC and I'm sick. I have a virus, because that's what PCs do, is they get viruses, woe is me. Um, and, and Justin Long is sitting there, like, just doing a kickflip on a skateboard or something, and he's, he's fun, uh, because Macs don't get viruses. That's just how it works. And we see, uh, uh, fast forward about 2011, so this has been going on for four years now, Max market share has about doubled, it's about 8% now, still a little smaller than 30%. Um, and you stop seeing this whole Max don't get malware thing anymore. And if we have any guesses why, because they do. Because they do. <laughs> um, and, and not only is it, so the market share increased, so more people want a piece of that pie because it's a bigger pie now. Um, but also there's sort of this concept in uh, the hacker space, and, and you'll see it in just about everywhere, but hackers are a little bit notorious for this. Um, and it's, it's the, the law of challenge acceptance. Uh, I, you know, you tell me I can't, and, and let's watch what happens now. Um, so we start seeing backdoor malware like OS X Pinhead and uh, the Black Hole Remote Access Tool. Uh, and they come onto the scene, and, and we stop hearing this whole Max don't get viruses thing as much anymore. I mean, the, the, the general populace had already allowed it to enter into their consciousness, and so you hear Mac fanboyism that still kind of echoed that, but their official marketing stopped leaning so heavily into that. I bring this up because, well, here we are, WordPress, 30% of the internet. If you're spinning up a new website, there's about a 70% chance you're going to click WordPress in uh, your hosting account. And it, 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 there's a knee-jerk reaction in the web hosting community and, and sysadmin communities. And of uh, the, the joke that I heard was, WordPress is a really excellent remote web shell with blogging features. <laughs> and it's clever, it's kind of a funny turn of phrase, but it, it makes me mad because I love WordPress, and I hope you guys do too, and WordPress is not insecure. Uh, WordPress has an amazing security team that's doing reviews of things as they can. All of them are human, and humans make mistakes. That's a whole other talk I give. And um, <laughs> it's easy to make an insecure WordPress site. WordPress is not insecure. Does that distinction not read to anybody? Cool. I just want to, I'm not here telling you that WordPress is insecure and here's how to stop that, um, but here's how to make more secure sites with WordPress. So, with awareness on the rise and the knowledge that WordPress sites are common targets, um, you've probably come across a guide of, of security best practices, things to do to, to help secure your WordPress site. I, mean, I, I would honestly be astonished if I was the first person to be in front of you or write something to you that says, update your plugins. Uh, is, is this the first time anybody's heard that? No? Okay, cool. Because we'll fix it, but wow. Um, and in my opinion, the gap here has to do with the difference between knowing something like factually speaking, and understanding it. 
So for example, I'll call myself out here. I can tell you that factually speaking, the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll also sit here and tell you that I have no meaningful understanding of what 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit is like. My brain just auto-corrects it to really hot. <laughs> and when you don't understand how an attacker is getting into a WordPress site, and, and you hear that there's a security epidemic and you need to do these things to secure your site, it can kind of feel like you're, you're doing emergency prep for an eventual like dragon attack. Like, I don't know the rules of dragons. What are they gonna do? I don't, I don't have, <laughs> and, and so by personifying this in a little bit more of a manageable way and explaining what happens in this process, hopefully, uh, just by making it understood how this stuff happens, you can at least take a look critically at your site and, and tell yourself some things that you can improve. And we're going to do that by putting our hacker hats on. Uh, if you've been to the WordFence booth, you've heard us say, you know, think like a hacker, improve your security posture that way. Um, the line put your hacker hat on is something that my, uh, one of my SANS instructors uh, used to rattle off a lot, and it makes a lot of sense. Because if you're a dev, or you're in content, or you're an agency doing design, you look at everything through those eyes. And, and it's tough to switch your eyes out. Um, but you want to you be able to look critically at this stuff from the perspective of somebody who wants to do something bad to you. And um, to do this, we're going to be taking a look at two sets of examples from, from start to finish, two attacks. One attack is going to be from a script kitty. Has anybody heard that term before? Yep. Yeah, uh, K-I-D-D-I-E, not like the, a small cat or anything. Um, so, <laughs> script kitty is sort of a, a, a derogatory term in the security community for somebody who paints themselves as a hacker and, and does naughty things out there on the internet using tools other people built without understanding how they work. It's okay to use a tool somebody else built. It's less okay to not know how it works and then you just sort of throw stuff out. And so, uh, they're, they're lower sophistication but much higher in volume. And you're also going to see low effort bot attacks fall under this same sort of field. The other one we're going to look at is a bit more sophisticated, though. This is going to be, say, an organized crime uh, person. I don't know, I started that weird. Um, somebody, somebody involved in organized crime or a nation state level attacker. This is somebody where you know, they have some sophistication, they have the skill to do what they need to do, and money is probably no object. If a nation state wants to break into something, they've got some budget behind it. So we're going to be looking at it from these four phases. Now, if you get into security theory, um, you're going to see a much more detailed tree than this. Uh, you can look up uh, the MITRE attack matrix. It's ATT ampersand CK because hackers love that. Um, but for our purposes, an attack has about four steps. Um, discovery, intrusion, infection, and response. Um, like I said, this isn't an industry standard thing, um, and your attacker is definitely not sitting there like, oh, I've entered the intrusion phase. <laughs> it's over, yeah. um, um, it, But it, it's handy to differentiate kind of what stage each, things happen to, each thing happens at, because we're going to talk about a layered security model where we're assuming failure. Um, so dividing this into nice, manageable chunks gives us a perspective to, to, to look at this from and, uh, and hopefully prevent future attacks. So, really to get in the meat and potatoes of this now. So in our first example of the discovery phase, we've got the script kitty. Um, has anybody seen an output that looks kind of like this? Does anybody recognize that? Yeah. I would like to figure out who's who here. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, the output of a tool called WP Scan. Uh, it's a very, very popular WordPress black box uh, vulnerability scanning utility. You can point WP, you shouldn't point WP scan at any site on the internet uh, that you do not personally own. But were you to do that, it can enumerate a lot of things. It can find, say, probably most of the usernames on that account. Well, WordPress doesn't care so much because usernames are not secrets in WordPress. Um, but we can also enumerate quite a bit of the plugins that you've got installed. And, and this is me as an unauthenticated attacker just looking for things like readme files on your server. Uh, in this case, uh, the text might be a little small, this is a small screen, but uh, 
we can see that there is an item that was found if I'm going to plug in on this site, and it was a plugin called Flickr the Picture Backup. Uh, it says it's up to date. It also says the last update was in 2014. So that's not uh, super great. Um, and we'll talk about the specific vulnerability in the next step. But the idea is there's not a lot that you're really going to reliably keep secret about your infrastructure. Trying to do that is something called security through obscurity. Um, the hot take on security through obscurity is it's pointless, don't ever do it. In reality, sure, don't make it the only thing you do, um, but it, it can slow down on sophisticated attackers for sure. Um, our second example though, with a more sophisticated attacker, um, so it's just the, the biggest dichotomy in this step is, is between an unsophisticated attacker and a sophisticated one. The script kitty is kind of just going to put on a wide net. They don't care who they're getting. They just want to get uh, backdoors and malware on as many sites and as many servers as they can. They don't care who you are. They don't care that you think that you're a small site and nobody knows you exist. Because uh, as we discussed already, nothing's a secret on the internet. But a more sophisticated attacker probably has a target in mind. Maybe this is an organization, uh, a government organization, maybe this is just a big business. Um, whatever the case may be, they've got somebody in mind. And, and now they're going to do a little bit more of a drill to find a way in. And the first step of this um, is going to be intel gathering. Um, this process usually begins with a process called OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence. And this is where attackers are gathering data about you, about your company, about your website. And we're compiling it into just this big portfolio so that we can later refer to it and we know all the stuff we need to. Um, so we're looking at any publicly accessible information. So uh, LinkedIn is a really big one. Uh, if you want an example of why, if I'm curious to know if business ABC, uh, what, what are they using on the back end for their web framework? Well, if I go and I find their company's LinkedIn profile, and then from there I find all of their engineering staff, and every single one of them mentions being an excellent Rails developer, they're probably using Rails. Um, same with WordPress, but WordPress you can probably guess that they're using somewhere, statistically speaking. Um, things like Twitter and Facebook. If I'm looking for a weak link in that organization, if I'm looking for maybe uh, a money-stressed sysadmin, uh, maybe he's complaining on Facebook about debt or not being able to make ends meet, or, oh boy, Christmas is coming up and that's a nightmare. Um, and if that's public and I find it, well, I'm a nation state attacker. I can give this guy a, a pen, it's just a pittance worth of money for me, but it's life changing for them. And, and they'll probably plug a USB stick into a server if I want them to for that, won't they? And that's not super great. But this intel gathering step is where I'm figuring this out. So I'm scraping the internet for email addresses because maybe now I want to know how your usernames are set up. You know, is it first initial, last name? Is it last name, first name? You know, so if I can find email addresses, I can do that. If I can spider out from there, find your employees' personal email addresses, well, now I might be able to identify that they've been in a password breach. Because I've got a handful of those sitting around ready to be sifted through for a, a password. And, um, and this one is a little bit uh, more security theory, but there's a tool called Cool. C-E-W-L, um, it's uh, a word list generator. So you can throw cool at a website uh, or a set of sites, and it's going to just spider this site looking for instances of unusual words and phrases. Uh, well, by default it looks for everything, but a, a practical application, we don't care about the word of, uh, of. But scanning a website for all these different words and then sorting them by how common they are is a surprisingly effective way to start guessing passwords. So, what are some takeaways during this discovery phase? Because we're looking at every phase one at a time with the idea of preventing somebody from getting past it. In example one, our script kitty probably would have been set back if that vulnerability scan they launched didn't find anything or if there was a web, ex or web application firewall in the way of preventing it from successfully scanning, or in some cases feeding it incorrect information back to send money to wild goose chase, 
but that's more just somebody being pesky. Um, example two is a little bit tougher though. You know, you can't be super draconian with all of your employees and say, I don't ever want you to say anything about work on social media ever. Turn off your LinkedIn, get off of Twitter. Like, it might be a little bit more secure, but you'll just kind of like scare all your employees away and you need to deal with all that. Um, but you can do some training, build some awareness of, of the sorts of things that probably shouldn't be shared with the internet. Um, and, and this is going to help to mitigate that kind of you know, non-critical data leakage that could be compiled into a, um, a portfolio or a, a, a database. Our next step, so after the discovery phase, we've got intrusion. Um, an important part of the vulnerability disclosure process is to produce a proof of concept. Uh, so if you find a vulnerability and you want to prove that you found a vulnerability to the people responsible, you build a thing that exploits it and you just ship it to them and say, hey, here it is, here's how to do it, fix it now. Um, so from our earlier example, that Flickr picture backup plugin, now the intended functionality of this plugin is so in your admin dashboard, you can feed it a URL of a Flickr photo. Flickr is an image hosting service that nobody ever uses anymore. Um, if you do, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, the idea was is you can point your admin dashboard, just plug in this field, and, and your site will reach out to Flickr and import that photo into your media library. Now, maybe not the way I would have implemented that, but here we are. And it's a plug in the repo. It might not be anymore. Um, but um, this plugin never did any, well, let's, let's start from the top here. So it didn't check to see that what you were downloading was from Flickr. Okay. It didn't check to see that what you were downloading was an image. And, and maybe I'm burying the lead on this a little bit, but it didn't even check to see if you were logged into WordPress. Now it's starting to come together. So you could effectively just send uh, a PHP request to this script if you can find the plugin on somebody's site with a free tool called WP Scan and just point it at any URL, you know, maybe a GitHub raw, maybe a paste bin link, and now we're pulling down arbitrary PHP code, storing it on their server in a place that we can identify later. Maybe it's a web shell, maybe it's some other malware dropper because now I'm infecting a website because it had a plugin installed that, by the way, was up to date. So we can talk about the virtues of not using a plugin that's been deprecated four years later, but um, it, it, it's pretty bad. And so if you've identified that vector exists, the intrusion step is trivial. You just point it at a site you control or a shell that you like, and then you're in. Example two. And it's going to be a little bit more up in the air depending on, on what you find during this intel gathering phase. Um, so with our gathering complete, our professional attacker is, is gearing up to attempt their intrusion. And fortunately for us, the attacker, not you guys, um, we have a handful of email addresses that we found. And these belong to uh, corporate accounts. But we've also gone further than that and associated a corporate account with a personal account, maybe multiple personal email accounts. And Bob's your uncle, a few of them are associated with password breaches from a while back. And if you've, uh, so who's heard of Have I Been Pwned? No. Uh, a little over half, which is good. I like it. Um, have I Been Pwned, uh, it's, uh, that's the domain, uh, have I been P -W -N -E -D com. It's a service uh, started by Troy Hunt, a security researcher out of Australia. And it's a really amazing utility that you can go and plug in your email address, and it'll tell you all of the breaches, well, the known breaches that that address is associated with. Now, they won't spit back out, you know, yes, you have been pwned, and here's the password. Uh, so you can't just like plug anybody's email into that and get, you know, passwords or access keys back. But what you can do is look and see if you appear on it, because it'll tell you what breaches you're in. And if this is a breach that, your attacker has a hold of, and that password that they've got is still active anywhere, now they can kind of walk through the front door. They know your password, they know your email address, and there we go. 
Now, the odds of any one individual's breached password from four years ago appearing on your WordPress site or on well, their WordPress site is, is kind of low, if we're being honest, but it's a numbers game. How many of these users did I identify? How many of those passwords did I identify? It only takes one to make a meaningful step into an uh, organization's infrastructure. You know, even if it's an unprivileged account, uh, privilege escalation is, is much easier than going from nothing at all. Do you have a, a quick question? Yeah, about the, um, so if they get the password from a personal email, or are you just saying if that person uses the same password professionally? Yes. <laughs> yep. Um, so this is an attack called credential stuffing, where we've identified a number of passwords that have been previously associated with you. We don't know if they're still associated with you, but we're going to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, depending on the scope, maybe we'll try it directly in your WordPress site, but maybe we'll use all these other accounts we found. Maybe we'll try to get into your Facebook or your Gmail account. Maybe now we can do some password resets elsewhere. So. The sophisticated attack is a lot of taking a step, pivoting, taking another step this direction, pivoting again. Because it's, it's not always as straightforward as, oh, they have a vulnerable plugin, let's attack it. Um, in this case, though, for the sake of our argument, we're going to say that they were successfully able to authenticate as an administrative user and upload malicious code through the WordPress plugin installer. It's a very common uh, modus operandi where if, if you've got admin, you can just upload a shell and then spread a backdoor from there. So, what are some takeaways during this intrusion step? Um, this is where most of your typical security best practices show up. So our, our target from example one uh, probably shouldn't have been running a plugin that hadn't been updated in four years. Um, this for number two though, um, we can all but entirely prevent credential stuffing attacks by A, using password managers um, and never reusing the same password twice. Um, I, I know exactly one password and it is the one that unlocks my password manager. And the rest of them are the 20 to 40 characters of the garbage that I will never memorize because um, I'm just pasting it in everywhere. So the, uh, another thing Troy <laughs> loves to say is the most secure password is the one you don't know. Um, we can also use, um, so there, there's, through Have I Been Pwned, there's a service called Pwned Passwords. Um, getting into the technicals might be a little waste of time in the context of this talk, but effectively you can put your password in. Um, it checks it anonymously, you're not actually shipping your password off to Troy Hunt. Um, but it will tell you if that password has appeared in breaches. Um, certain security plugins, uh, WordFence included, uh, will tell you if you log in to your site and that password appears in a breach. So if you just installed it and then you try to log in again and it won't let you, um, it's probably because that password has been seen somewhere and, and we don't want you to use that anymore. Um, and then also implementing two-factor authentication is really important. That way even if your password gets breached, they, they still can't log into your site without also having a physical device that you control. Still a big deal that they have your password, but maybe not quite so operational. Now, the infection step is where it gets a little bit more freeform, because now we're, we're in. We've gotten in for the first time, which is a landmark in, in an attack, right? The first time you get into a system that doesn't want you there um, is where we're doing all this, you know, OSN gathering and um, exploiting vulnerabilities and plugins and stuff, but once we've gotten in once, we kind of have free reign to enable ourselves to come and go as we please. Um, in the case of our less sophisticated attacker, we're going to see kind of a staple of internet malware, the spam mailer. Uh, this is an example of a real spam mailer. Uh, it's a pretty basic one, uh, but the idea is, even if you're some you know, why, why would anybody hack me, I'm a nobody kind of website, your, mail, your outgoing mail relay on your hosting account probably hasn't been put on any spam blacklist yet. I would like to fix that. Um, so we can throw a spam bot on there and start sending out spam email. Maybe this is, you know, sketchy pills advertising, maybe this is some other kind of spam marketing, but maybe 
we're launching other types of attack from here. What we see in a lot of cases is these spam mailers are going to be used to send out phishing emails. Um, everybody know phishing? Um, a lot of the cases where you're going to see somebody getting phished is they're getting an email that says, hey, I'm from DHL and your package is stuck somewhere. You need to log in and tell me uh, what to do with it. Or, hey, we found some weird activity on your PayPal account. Log in and let's figure it out. Um, and there will be, be a link in that email that takes you to bobsquiltingsite.com slash PayPal. And uh, now it's, it looks like a PayPal site. It's definitely not PayPal. Don't put anything in there. Um, but um, using this as a platform to direct recipients to phishing or malware droppers is a, is a very large and lucrative thing to do. Um, and that's how a lot of these cases take place. Um, in our second example, uh, does everybody know what that uh, uh, little device is there? Anybody seen those before? Thermal? What's that? Thermal? It, yeah, it's a credit card skimmer on an ATM. So you can actually see the, uh, the plastic shell that somebody's pulled off of the identical plastic shell. Um, and that's going to have a little chip in it that can read your card as it goes into the legitimate ATM uh, card reader. We see things like that on e-commerce sites where we're, we're harvesting credit cards, we're harvesting usernames and passwords of these accounts. And, and this isn't something where we can just throw an SSL certificate, or sorry, TLS, I really need to get out of that habit. Um, TLS encryption is not going to stop this because they're not snatching it out of the sky. They're making a copy before they even send it to the payment processor. And then they're sending that off to themselves or, or just logging it somewhere to get picked up later. Um, and they're doing this by just injecting a little bit of JavaScript into the website. Uh, it's really, really hard for the layman to detect some JavaScript running quietly on a payment gateway. Um, so with, if, if they're able to get something like that in place, then potentially every credit card transaction that goes through it is compromised. And what they'll do is uh, they'll find themselves uh, scraping data out and then selling it wholesale rather than using every individual card. Um, bad news here uh, is if they've reached this point, they've likely got a pretty serious foothold in your account. Um, and the worst part is, is you're not even aware of it yet. So. Um, Taking care of the infection itself falls under the next step, but our job in this phase is simply to become aware of the infection as early as is possible. So, and I kind of have to hurry, I was uh, going fairly slow. Um, so, response for our example one. So a site infected with a spam mailer is probably sending out a lot of email. The idea here is to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening in your server. Um, if you're seeing a big use of outgoing mail relays, you're seeing CPU spiking with no uh, subsequent increase in traffic to account for it. If you're monitoring this stuff, you can identify when something is happening. Better yet, you can use some kind of intrusion detection system like a malware scanner, and that'll at least let you know when something has been found. A malware scanner is not necessarily going to clean up every possible backdoor, but the earlier that you can be notified that something has happened, the more time you have to respond to it before everything completely explodes on you. On the other hand, a pro's card skimmer is generally going to be brought to the attention of the site owner uh, through something called a common purchase log, where if I have seen 60 breached credit cards, I'm on Visa or something at this point, and I've had 60 breached credit cards, and 59 of them have all made a, pre a recent purchase from your website, they're going to notify you of that, and then you can do an audit there um, in the middle of all the legal trouble you're probably about to try to dig out of. Um, in the case of resource theft attacks, like spam mailers, just keep an eye on your server usage stats. Um, and then for a card skimmer, uh, cleaning services and stuff like that are going to help mitigate that, but this is why we're always making backups. Um, again, don't rely on a malware scanner to completely clean everything for you. If, if you've got a malware scanner, and it's telling you, we found three things and we cleaned three things. You're definitely good, man. It's all good. Um, well, maybe they didn't find something. Um, this is an intrusion detection. It's an indicator of compromise. It's not a list of everything wrong with your website. Um, and, and at the same time, try to ignore the desire, or, or at least 
not hacked on the desire to hunt down and kill your attacker, um, because it's not gonna work, first of all. And the IP address you're gonna see in your logs probably doesn't really have anything to do with the geographical location of the person attacking you. VPNs are cheap, Tor is free, and the odds are they're probably attacking you from another server they've infected anyway. Um, threat modeling is a big thing. It could probably be its own talk by itself, but it can be summed up into one question. What do I have and who might want it? And then subsequently, kind of the footnote there is, how hard will they work to get it? Um, in the context of, say, larger organizations, um, you may have personal records of employees that I want. You may have client data. You may have a number of things that, they, that I might want to exfiltrate. Um, and while that particular information may not be sitting on your WordPress site, uh, I can probably use that to pivot and, and get somewhere else. So the largest thing here is assume breach. At every stage of this process, through every step of the way, you want to assume that the previous one has failed. You cannot really adequately uh, plan for incident response when you confidently believe that nobody will ever get to this step in the first place. Um, threat modeling and risk analysis is a, a big thing, um, and, and I'm not an expert in that specifically, but if you assume breach, it's, it's better than the only alternative, which is to assume that you have not been breached. And I'll tell you which one of those is more secure. Thanks. We've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle there. If anybody wants to uh, line up, or, uh, I think he's probably going to help you out there. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had any recommendations as far as a researcher who is looking at your business and trying to find personal information, um, any resources out there for seeing what you have that's public and, you know, so that you can, like, identify things that maybe shouldn't be public and yeah, take um, care of that? So, um, there is, a lot of it's just going to be what can you do yourself. Um, there, there are aggregators out there. Um, if there was one thing to write down, it would be OSM Framework. Um, it's uh, a website you can go and it's just this really, really enormous spider tree of different categories of stuff that you can use for information gathering. Um, and it'll provide its own set of tools from there. Um, another part of it is just kind of understanding at some level what is valuable data and where that kind of thing can live. So like the LinkedIn thing where uh, I want to know what infrastructure an organization is using, so I'm going to see what their engineers are bragging about on LinkedIn. Um, it, that's just going to kind of come from understanding of the human element. Um, and, and getting into things like social engineering, which is it's a whole other talk, um, there's a lot of data that can be manipulated in a bad way. Even so much as telling somebody what pest control service your office uses tells them what uniform to buy or steal to get unlimited access to your business. Um, so it's it's tough to say because this is kind of like simultaneously everything and nothing. Um, so it's something that you want to look at case by case and see what's going to be relevant to your specific business. Um, and so OSM Framework is a good one for that. But really just Google the names of employees, uh, Google email addresses, see where things have shown up. Um, and as far as actual breach data, really lean into have I been pumped because it's a really good resource. Anybody else? You mentioned uh, password managers. Um, I've kind of been staying away from those because I'm afraid if somebody gets in there, they've got all of them then. So how do you know how to pick one that's trustworthy? So that's a really good question. Um, Having a single point of failure with your password manager is a scary case to be in. At the same time, if you are your own single point of failure, then you're in the exact same spot you left. So there's, there's a lot of cloud-based password managers out there, LastPass, 1Password, and, and you hear cases where somebody's LastPass account gets breached, and, and that can be devastating, but it, it is a much smaller surface area and a much 
much smaller likelihood of compromise than having one universe password that you keep in your head and use everywhere. Um, I personally use KeePass. It's, a, um, it's not cloud-based. It can be made cloud-based um, if you um, sync it through Dropbox or I use a personal xCloud account. My password vault is on every one of my devices synchronized to each other but never talks to a third party that I do not control. But I am me. You are not necessarily me. That might not be necessary. But any third party service like LastPass or OnePass is going to be better than nothing, hands down. I'm curious on what your opinion on the um, company out here that has the QR scanner to get into WordPress instead of username and password. Is that a valid step that we should take? So that one is unique. So I haven't had time. That one loves you. Um, I haven't had time to personally vet it. <laughs> haven't had time to personally vet uh, that particular implementation. From my understanding, it's it's the, the theory is sound. So it's not that um, this is some magic QR code uh, that gets you into a site. What it is is we are showing a QR code to a user on a desktop, and then their phone, which is authenticated um, and is associated with this account. With, so whichever device uh, shows us this QR code brings that uh, account to that computer. Um, so it's, if somebody else has a phone and snaps that QR code, it's not that your account is getting zapped to their phone, it's that their account is getting zapped to your computer. Um, I, I, I couldn't confidently tell you the, the effectiveness of that implementation, um, but the theory is there. Is there time for one more? Yeah. Cool. Uh, is there any way? I just asked if there's time for one more for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have two basic profiles. I was wondering if you had an idea of if there was actually like a hate group who was, you know, targeting somebody for political reasons like where they would tend to fall along that kind of spectrum? That's a really good question. Um, and and it, unfortunately, it, the answer to a lot of these is going to be, it kind of depends. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the resources at play. It depends on how official this activity is. Um, if you've got some internet hive mind on your side and, uh, and that they have an agenda, then it's really up to the level of the sophistication of each individual member of that hive mind. On the numbers side of it, it's probably going to be more low sophistication, script kiddies, like bots with the pulse kind of thing. But if, if this is a group with a lot of money and they're not afraid to use it, then they can buy a professional. Or they may already have. Um, that, again, comes into the concept of, of threat modeling and risk analysis and who, has, what, who wants what I have, that kind of thing. Uh, I can just contribute to the, uh, the answer there, Mike. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Mark Bonder, the CEO of WordPress. Say hi, Mark. Hey, hi. Um, <laughs> one of the ways that you've seen in the industry um, activists and journalists and so on targeted is through spear phishing. And so the attacker will use open source intelligence, which Mike keep referred to in his talk, to build a really good profile of the person in the company, what relationships they have, and so on. And then they'll target them with a very sophisticated spear phishing campaign, perhaps an email that says, hey, Joe from such and such company, and uh, Joe's an known associate. Um, want to talk to you about the meeting we have on Tuesday because someone tweeted about it. And again, open source intelligence. Check out this document, and it's a PDF or something that has an exploit. Um, so that's uh, something that uh, the industry has seen a fair amount of. Yeah, so for, for the people at home, not on uh, the microphone or anything, um, spear phishing campaigns have been seen, and that is what would fall under more sophisticated. Um, you don't really need to be a super legit computer hacker to do a spear phishing campaign. You just need to know how to trick someone. Uh, but it is a little bit higher effort than throwing a scanner at something. Um, but it is very real where we see cases of, of somebody building this profile and then launching an attack on an individual um, just because we know how to talk to them and, and manipulate them to do what we want. Um, thanks. <laughs>